More than 55 years ago, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, started through the Bible with the vision of taking the whole word to the whole world. And we continue to make that same mission our priority to this day. I'm Steve Schwetz, welcoming you aboard the Bible bus for another great study in God's incredible word. Dr. McGee's vision began by delivering through the Bible studies like the one that you're listening to right now. And our goal is to provide you with this life-changing Bible teaching every day in whatever way that works best for you. Now, you may like to listen on the radio, or maybe you're joining us online at ttb.org, or maybe you got a tablet or phone and you're using one of our apps. Maybe you prefer our Bible companions. Doesn't matter, whatever works for you, our goal is really simple, to get sound Bible teaching to you, knowing that God promises His Word will do what He intends in each of our hearts. So if you've been with us for very long, you know that this ministry is a partnership effort. It's really a labor of love for a lot of people. And that includes those of you who pray for and financially support this ministry. Now, we don't talk a lot about finances at Through the Bible. We believe that God raises up people to support the financial needs of this ministry according to how he's used it in their lives. And you know what? God has been so faithful to us over the years. And you have as well by supporting. And we pray that the people who have been blessed by this teaching will also support it financially going forward. Now, today, as we conclude our study in Colossians, we'll hear about servants and masters and about those who served with Paul in getting out the word of God to those who lived in the first century. Well, we're the ones who are serving God in getting out the word of God to those who live in the 21st century, aren't we? Would you like to take an active part in keeping the broadcast on the air by faithfully praying for this ministry, as well as going out in all the different formats we have? And then would you please consider how God would have you financially support the outreach of Through the Bible? To give you a bit of perspective on financial support, here's Dr. McGee to share our guiding principles. And I think because I say so little about giving to the program that a great many people get the impression that we have no need or that someone underwrites the program, or something happens that enables us to continue without a great deal of promotion. Well, may I say to you, that's our policy, has been from the beginning. And from time to time, we call attention to the fact that we are just as dependent upon our listeners as any program is. We do not use gimmicks. We do not use high-powered promotion. We do not send out pictures of orphans. We do not indulge in that type, and we're not actually criticizing that type of ministry. We're just trying to say that's not our method, and we do depend upon our listeners. Support the Bible bus as it rolls through your neighborhood and in more than 250 languages around the world by visiting ttb.org forward slash give or calling 1-800-65-BIBLE or writing to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C 6B1. Now let's commit this final study in Colossians to the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and how it directs us to lift high the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, too, Lord, for the opportunity to stand with others in getting your word to the nations. And then would you help us now to listen to your word and receive what you have for each of us? It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now turn to Colossians 3 as we make our way through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, last time we concluded the third chapter And by the way, we did it rather rapidly. In fact, almost, I would say, too rapidly. And I'd like to just pick up here a few things that we feel that we should call attention to because this fourth chapter opens and the very first verse does belong to the third chapter. And in some of our manuscripts, it's put with the third chapter. And it has to do with masters, that is the boss. And here, I go back to verse 22, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service. That is, don't watch the clock, keep your eye on Christ. As man pleasers, but in singleness of heart, 
fearing the Lord. And this is the simplicity of a Christian's life. Paul could reduce his life down to just one goal. The one thing had top priority in his life. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth for those things which are before I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You see, he had his eye and his mind and his heart and his total affections fixed upon Jesus Christ. Now, that reduces life down to the lowest common denominator and gives us the highest answer that you can get. And, of course, that answer is Christ himself. And here, the idea is not to fear the boss, but to fear God. And he concludes with that, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord. Well, the word heartily here, that is work from your soul. We hear a great deal today about a soul brother, but we ought to have a little more soul work. That is that whatever we do, we're doing it to the Lord, not to man, not to be man pleasers. And he goes on to say, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Now, that simply means that you're not going to have to report to your boss, maybe. When his back is turned, he doesn't see that you're loafing on the job. He doesn't see that you're not really giving him a full day's work. But the Lord Jesus does. And you're going to answer to him because, see, you are in him and you belong to him. And therefore, you have to give an account of your life to him. And since we represent him down here upon the earth, he's going to ask that his representative be found faithful, you see, knowing that of the Lord. And I'm of the opinion that a great many folk, humble people that you and I know nothing about today, who've been faithful, faithful on the job, faithful to their employer, faithful to their church, faithful to their pastor. And very few people know about them. They're going to get a reward. And I think you and I are going to be surprised someday when we see what a handsome reward they're going to get. A reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Now, that just puts a different complexion upon Christian service down here. There's so many today that are lazy in God's work. I would say that one of the curses of the ministry and I find this has been true of a staff. It's been so easy for them to loaf on the job. Nobody looking, nobody watching. But we serve the Lord Christ. We're going to give an account to him. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there's no respect of persons. And just because you happen to be in God's service and you feel like that you're may be something special because you're teaching a Sunday school class. When he judges you, friends, that won't make any difference at all. All will be judged alike. And we're talking now about believers that go before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, in chapter 4, verse 1, I come down to this verse here. He says, Masters, now, not only the servant, but the master. Master, give unto your servants that which is just and equal. And equal here means to not level down, but to level up. It means that you're to do right by them, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven, and you're going to stand before Christ someday. Every Christian employer, as well as employee, will stand before God. And by the way, this does put the gospel in shoe leather, does it not? And it gets right down where the rubber meets the road. And by the way, it gets right down where your foot is walking in the factory and in the office or whatever you're doing. You're to do it under the Lord because you're going to answer to him if you're his child. What a tremendous statement this is. Now he goes on to say here, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Continue in prayer. Here. And this is real prayer that he's talking about. And watch. These two words are put together here, and they are very important. Watch and pray. 
And you remember the experience of Nehemiah in this connection. You remember that the thing that he did was when the enemy tried to stop him from rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, he just didn't throw in the towel and cry out that he couldn't do the job, nor did he just say, well, we'll make it a matter of prayer and just continue as he was. This is what Nehemiah said he did. He says, we made our prayer and we set a watch. (laughs) And right here, Paul says, watch and pray. The old preacher down years ago in Georgia, I was trying to recall his name and I can't think of it, but years ago down in Georgia, he used to make this statement. He says, when a farmer prays for a corn crop, God expects him to say amen with a hole. And if you're praying about something, then you need to get busy about it. And you have that same thing today, a lot of pious nonsense. I got a letter from a preacher. He said, I've been to Mayo Clinic. I went there and they found out I have cancer and they recommend an operation. But he says, I've come home and I've decided I'm going to do like you did, just trust the Lord. Well, I sat down and wrote him a letter in a hurry. I said, brother, I didn't just trust the Lord. I went to what I think is the finest cancer specialist out here on the West Coast. And I know that my case was brought up before the UCLA Medical Clinic and was discussed there. And they recommended the best thing that medical science knew to do. And I wrote him and I said, they did all that. And I said, I've had two operations for cancer. Now, I said, let me say this to you, brother. If you want to be an intelligent Christian, I think you are, then you get down to male brothers as quickly as you can, tell them to operate. That's what they want to do. Then I says, you trust the Lord that he'll bring you through it. Now, I said, that's what I did. That's watch and pray, watch and pray, be on the job. That's what Paul, my, this is so practical. It's very practical. Now, he says, he continues here, Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. And be sure and thank God always, as we have said back in Ephesians, thank him because he's going to hear and answer your prayer. Oh, maybe not the way you prayed, but he'll answer. With all praying also for us. Paul says, don't forget us. And I'd like to add that right here too. Don't forget us. And you can't help Paul any longer by praying for him, but you can help our radio ministry and you can help your pastor with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I'm also in bonds. And Paul was in prison, but he said, I want to be released, and I want to go out through an open door that I might preach the gospel. And I consider every radio station, we have a door. And I ask God, keep the doors open. He promised he would. That's our verse, you remember, in Revelation. He says, I've set before you an open door. And he set before us a lot of open doors, but we ask him to open some more too, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Now he says here, walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Now the child of God has a responsibility before the world today. Walk in wisdom. Don't be foolish as a child of God. And I repeat this. There's so much pious nonsense today. There's a woman right here in Southern California wrote me a letter. She rebuked me for going to the doctor, not trusting the Lord. That's the way she put it. I trusted the Lord. But she says, I have cancer and I'm trusting the Lord. And I don't go to a doctor. I don't guess I need tell you that they buried her not too long ago. And she died of cancer. And the neighbors, I understand, they smile. They said, this Christianity is foolish sort of thing, isn't it? Oh, my friend, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. And that means buying up the opportunities. When you see an opportunity, now you don't force yourself on people, but pray that the Lord leads you. And I wish I had time to tell you today about how the Lord, not only in my life, but so many others that I could tell you about how they just prayed and asked him to open the door. And he opened the door. But let him open the door before you and I make the mistake of putting our foot in our mouth. I've knocked on a door many a time as a pastor 
and stepped in and put my foot in my m- mouth the very first thing. And I did that so much that I decided I'd do lots more praying about it because we can make a mistake. He says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. And a great many people think, let your speech be salt. They really sting you with, you know, little sarcastic remarks. But it means always with grace, seasoned with salt. In other words, a child of God should have a conversation that deters evil, not promotes it, should withhold it, you see. And I think it also has in it the idea, don't be boring as a Christian. Oh, the Lord forgive us for being boring as Christians. We ought to be excited about all this, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Now, we come to a list here that's remarkable, beginning at verse 7 of chapter 4 of Colossians. What we have here is a list of names of people that Paul knew, and they are men and women that lived back there in the first century. They walked down Roman roads, lived in Roman cities. They were under Roman rule. They were in the midst of paganism, but they were God's children. And many of these were in Ephesus. And when I was there, I climbed up in that theater there and sat down high up. And I looked down that great marble boulevard, Harbor Boulevard's what it is, leads right down to where the harbor was in that day. And I thought, well, you could see Paul come walking up there. There would be Tychicus coming up there, and there's Onesimus and Aristarchus and Epaphras, all these fellows, they were Christians, God's men back yonder in the first century. Now, the interesting thing is this. Paul had never been to Rome. Paul had never been to Colossae. And yet, he gives a list of people here that he knew, and many of them from these two places. And it reveals that Paul had led many people to Christ in cities that he never visited. His ministry was a tremendous ministry. Now, I'm going to call the roll of these folk here. Let's go down hurriedly. He says, verse 7, All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. Now, we have here first this man Tychicus. And he was one of those that was there. He was pastor of the church in Ephesus. We've talked about him before. Wonderful brother in the Lord. Then verse 9, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother. Now, Onesimus was a slave of Philemon in Colossae, and he was being sent back by Paul, who had led him to the Lord, back to his master. Now, he'd run away to Rome, and Paul, having led him to Christ, Now he sends him back to Philemon. But he tells Philemon, as he says here, he's a beloved brother. (laughs) And you see, in Christ, there is now a new relationship. And he's your brother now. Then we have Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluted you. He was a friend of Paul. He made good, and he was there with Paul. He was in prison with him. And then Marcus, sister's son, to Barnabas. And you remember, Paul sent John Mark. He didn't send him back, but John Mark went back. And because of that, Paul wouldn't take him on a second missionary journey. But Paul was wrong about John Mark. He made good. And Paul here acknowledges it. He says, touching whom you receive commandments. If he come unto you, receive him. Don't do like I did. You receive him. And he says, in his swan song, Second Timothy, he's profitable to me for the ministry. Bring him with you. Wonderful fellow. And here is Jesus, which is called Justice. And the name in Hebrew was, of course, Joshua, who are of the circumcision. There were few, you see, Israelites, Jews in the Colossian church, but not many, mostly a Gentile church. These only are my fellow workers under the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. These are wonderful brethren, you see. They were Paul's helpers and great missionaries themselves. Now he goes on to some more. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you always, laboring fervently for you in prayers, 
that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Now, Epaphras was the pastor in Colossae, but he's in prison. And so he has a new ministry. He is praying now. I told a young preacher that's paralyzed and he can't preach anymore. And he just wrote a most discouraging letter. And I wrote and told him, I said, I have a job for you. Pray for me. That is a ministry today. Pray for God's servants. If he takes you out of active service, it means he's got something else for you to do. He says, for I bear him record that he hath a zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. These three cities were actually very close together. Hierapolis and Laodicea are very close together. Some say six miles, others 10 miles. Didn't seem to me like it was very far. I've been to both places, but I didn't get over to Colossae. And these churches were in these different places. Now he says, Luke, the beloved physician. Isn't that a wonderful designation for him? Dr. Luke, he's the beloved physician. And Demas greets you. Wish I could talk a little about Demas, but we're going to talk about him later. Paul, when he first mentions him, he says, he's my fellow worker. And here all he calls him is just Demas. Paul's not sure about him here. A little later on, he forsakes him. How tragic. Now he says, salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church which is in his house. You see, there were great heathen temples, but the church at this time meant in homes. I used to hold this viewpoint, and I still do, but I don't emphasize it today like I did one time. The church started in the home. I believe it's going to come back to the home. Now, and when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Now, this is not an epistle to Laodicea, but it's an epistle that they had read, and it apparently was being circulated. Now, a great many of the scholars believe that that is the epistle of the Ephesians that we have today, and that it was at this time in Laodicea over in the area where Hierapolis and also the Colossians could have it also. Now he says, and say to Archippus, take heed. Now here's another fellow here, and his name is Archippus. Now, what do we know about Archippus? Well, very frankly, we don't know too much about him other than what Paul tells us here. Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord that thou fulfill it. Now, here is a man that had a gift, and Paul is urging him to use that gift. Now, listen to Paul. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Now, Paul dictated most of his letters. The one to the Galatians, he wrote himself. And here, Paul signs it, you see. He says to them, this is the second time, remember my bonds, pray for me, he says. Grace be with you, amen. Isn't this a glorious, wonderful little letter that we've had here? Paul wrote to a church. He'd never visited the church, but he knew the church because he led most of them there to the Lord. In fact, Philemon had a church in his house in Colossae. Next time we go back to the Old Testament, again, a new section of the Old Testament, prophecy, the book of Isaiah. May God richly bless you, my beloved. Dr. McGee's messages in Colossians are available in several different formats. First, you can download our app or visit us online at ttb.org forward slash Colossians. There you're going to find the entire study available anytime you'd like to listen. Or if you'd prefer to have all of Dr. McGee's five-year study available at your fingertips, you can check out our Bible Bus flash drive. It contains the entire five-year program, and it allows you to listen to whatever study you want at any time that you want. It also includes more than 100 of Dr. McGee's digital booklets and all of his notes and outlines. To find out more, call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE or visit ttb.org. And while you're at ttb.org, be sure to check out Dr. McGee's digital booklet, Forget About It how to put the past behind you. If you're still stewing over the sins of your past and you need help moving forward with joy and confidence, this teaching from Philippians can help. 
As Dr. McGee just mentioned, next time the Bible bus steers back to the Old Testament as we begin a study of the prophetic book of Isaiah. Hop aboard and invite a friend to join you. I'm Steve Schwetz, and as always, I'm going to be right here saving a seat just for you. God bless you today as you walk with Him in His Word. We're grateful for our committed listening family who faithfully pray and invest in Through the Bible as we together take the whole word to the whole world.